Six weeks ago, the House of Commons in Canada passed the Bill of Rights. This was presumably to help to safeguard our rights against an encroaching state and against the encroaching complexities of our society. But rather than prejudge the issue, we have the man who can tell us about that, and I'm going to address my first question directly to him. Mr. Fulton, what was the thinking behind the Bill of Rights? Why was it passed at this last session of Parliament? Well, there are a number of reasons I could give, but I'll, I'll try and give you just two or three of the main ones. <clears throat> the first is one that you have yourself mentioned, and that is the increasing complexity of government and the fact that government now enters into the private life and affairs affecting the private welfare of individuals in ways in which it never used to do, say, 50 years or more ago. So it seemed to us important uh, then to uh, have legislation on our statute books outlining the rights and freedoms of an individual against which a government could not encroach. Are uh, these <coughs> new, or is this merely a formalization of what has already existed? No, we haven't pretended that we're creating a vast number of new rights. We're, we're reducing to legislative and concrete form, thus giving them that much more protection, rights which we have always taken for granted in Canada. <coughs> that leads me into the second reason, and that is that uh, <coughs> to, a, to a great extent, if not completely, we in Canada, while possessing and enjoying these rights and freedoms, have possessed them by what I might call the accident of inheritance. Mm -hmm. No one is prouder than, than I am <clears throat> of the fact that we do inherit the British constitutional system and the principles of the British common law. But <clears throat> there are many thousands, if not millions, of Canadians now who have come from countries where these principles are not necessarily known, um, so that for that reason, it seemed, it seemed desirable to have our own declaration of rights um, in order that they might form part of, a, of Canadian legislation rather than merely being enjoyed by the accident of inheritance. Ontario Court of Justice Act, Article 11.2. The Superior Court of Justice has all the jurisdiction, power, and authority historically exercised by courts of common law and equity in England and Ontario. Vincent v. Ottawa, Judgment, the Superior Court of Justice has all the jurisdiction, power, and authority historically exercised by courts of common law and equity. We saw in the opening video how the Canadian minister claimed that the Bill of Rights, which is a statutory power, was created to promote and secure the historical rights and freedoms brought forth through the common law of Great Britain. The minister said, that common law rights were grandfathered into Canadian law and that the Bill of Rights would secure their enforcement. From this declaration, from this little speech, we learn that common law rights exist in Canada, that these rights were in operation prior to Canada becoming a dominion, and that these common law rights operate apart from any statutory power. We can find agreement with what the Minister was declaring when we look at the word of the courts here in Canada. When we look to Thompson Newspaper Limited versus Canada, we find the following. While individuals, as a rule, have full legal capacity by operation of law alone, artificial persons are creatures of the state and enjoy civil rights and powers only upon the approval of statutory authorities. The individual may stand upon his constitutional rights. He owes no duty to the state since he receives nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. His rights are such as existed by the law of the land long before the organization of the state and can only be taken from him by due process of law and in accordance with the Constitution. The individual's rights exist by the law of the land long before Canada became a dominion. The individual's common law rights were brought forth through the law of England and established in Canada officially through the Bill of Rights. Common law rights, human rights and fundamental freedoms were transferred over into Canadian law. As we saw that minister state, they come over from Britain, from Great Britain, from England, their old common law, their rights, their fundamental freedoms were transferred into domestic law, but they were grandfathered in. So in 1867, when Canada became a dominion, those laws came into existence, but there was no Bill of Rights to enforce those rights and freedoms. In 1960, they produced a Bill of Rights to try and make it official, to try and make it say that these human rights and freedoms operate within domestic law. 
Now, if these rights and freedoms, human rights, common law, were transferred over to Canada, that means that they existed before Canada was a dominion. How could you transfer something over to Canada if it's not already in existence? Thompson Newspaper Limited versus Canada, dealing with full legal capacity. Now, full legal capacity includes your ability to exercise your human rights, your fundamental rights and freedoms. Now, these rights exist before Canada became a dominion. That's what the court judgment states. So again, what are we seeing? We're seeing common law that was exercisable in Great Britain and England being transferred into Canadian law. First, it was transferred through an operation called Grandfathered In. Secondarily, it's being protected now by the Bill of Rights since 1960. And again, remember that the Bill of Rights that they created is nothing more than a statutory power. It's not foundational law for the country, but a statutory power that was introduced to try and protect human rights and fundamental freedoms. Common law rights and freedoms now must find their expression through the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. No longer can an individual point to a common law of England or of any other nation to claim that the executive powers of Canada have violated their fundamental rights and freedoms. Supreme Court has made it clear in cases M.A. v. Ryan that common law must develop in accordance with charter values. A trespass in common law equals an infringement or denial of a fundamental right or freedom contained within the charter. Now, Thompson Newspaper Limited versus Canada. In sum, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized that the Canadian Bill of Rights enjoys constitutional or quasi-constitutional stature. As such, approach to its interpretation as presumably as appropriate as it is for the Charter or for other enactments concerned with human rights. The purpose of the Canadian Bill of Rights disclosed by its long title, an act for the recognition and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms, is shared by the Charter. Accordingly, it might be expected that evolution of the two instruments will follow roughly parallel lines over the course of time with the possibility of earlier decisions under the bill attracting reconsideration in light of the authoritative pronouncements concerning the scope of equivalent language in the Charter. Common law rights, also known as human rights and fundamental freedoms, were grandfathered in to domestic law, into Canadian law. After that, they found their expression within the Canadian Bill of Rights in 1960. Now, since then, common law, human rights and fundamental freedoms find their expression in the Constitution Act of 1982, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We saw that the Supreme Court of Canada, case M.A. v. Ryan, stated that a violation of common law or human rights and freedoms will now means or equals a trespass against the Charter. So that's the historic background of our common law rights. They were in England, they were in Great Britain, they were operating. They, f they transferred over into Canadian domestic law through being grandfathered in. They became relevant and enforceable to a degree through the Canadian Bill of Rights. After that, 1976, the International Covenants became uh, an authority in the world. And those rights and freedoms had to be expressed in the Constitution. At the same time, our common law, our human rights and freedoms, were now transferred into the Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So we still have our common law rights. They are human rights and freedoms. But now, if we want to claim a violation of our common law rights, of our human rights and fundamental freedoms, then we must claim a trespass against one of our Charter rights. And that's the only operation of law that works now. If you try and bypass here and go back to common law in England, it won't work. If you try to bypass here and go into just the Bill of Rights, it won't work. You're missing your operation of law. Why? Because it started from the common law in England, it grandfathered into domestic law, went into the Bill of Rights, now it exists and presently in 2017 our rights abide, or we can find them, they are enumerated, they are classified within the Constitution Act of 1982. And if we want to claim that there's been a violation of our fundamental rights and freedoms, then we must prove 
that there's been a trespass against our charter rights. So if you try to go back to the Magna Carta, you try to go back to anything else, you're, you're using a wrong operation of law, the courts will not hear you. Why? Because they're telling you it started from common law, went into domestic law, went into the Bill of Rights. Now you find these rights and freedoms expressed in the Constitution. End of story. Prior to the Constitution Act of 1982, even though human rights, common law rights, did indeed exist within Canada, the mechanism to enforce these rights and freedoms were weak and did not give individuals the power they needed to fight against the executive powers of Canada. When we look at the court judgment R versus Hines, prior to the Charter's advent, the individual really had no special means of protecting against incursions upon his or her basic fundamental rights by executive or legislative arm of the state. There were no means at the disposal of individuals to muster court challenges aimed at invalidating legislative, executive, or administrative acts. Respect for the rule of law, upon which, as W. Evor Jennings in his text entitled The Law and the Constitution, points out at page 42, hinges the existence of public order. It mandated compliance with directive and ordinances, even if they infringed upon individual fundamental rights and freedoms. The way the law and the Constitution of 1867 were set up, these operations of law demanded compliance and placed public order as the most important factor. Individuals were expected to submit and surrender to public law, civil law, even though these statutory laws were limiting and abridging the individual's fundamental human rights and freedoms. A primary purpose of the Charter was to change this relationship of the individual with the state and its laws by endowing or giving individuals an effective means of challenging acts of the state in courts on a ground of violation of their constitutionally protected rights and freedoms. The Constitution Act of 1982 changed this completely. No longer was public order the primary governing factor when it came to creating laws. The Constitution Act of 1982 is the foundational law of Canada. It is the supreme law of Canada and is expressing our common law, our human rights and fundamental freedoms. If any statutory power limits or abridges your human rights and freedoms, as guaranteed in the Constitution Act, then these statutory powers, these enactments, are of no force or effect against you. The Canadian Constitution Act of 1982, as declared in Section 52, the Constitution of Canada is the supreme law of Canada and any law that is inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution is to the extent of the inconsistency of no force or effect. Canada will attempt to apply the enactments, the regulations, the statutory powers against us only subject to the Charter. Meads versus Meads, a claim that a relationship between an individual and the state is always one of contract is clearly incorrect. Aspects of that relationship may flow from mutual contract. For example, a person or corporation may be hired by the government to perform a task such as road maintenance, but the state has the right to engage in unilateral action only subject to the Charter. It is their position that Canada can force you to play the role of a class of being, a class of person, unless... By forcing you into this position, they are limiting and abridging a charter right or freedom, your human rights and freedoms. Prior to the charter, an individual had no special means to protect himself against incursions against his basic fundamental rights and freedoms as a human being. Now, we find this in R versus Haynes. This is being explained to us in this court judgment talking about what's transpiring prior to the Charter. So, prior to the Charter, we had the Bill of Rights. But the Bill of Rights was only a statutory power. Even though it expressed human rights and fundamental freedoms, it was still a statutory power. Now, the Bill of Rights was not powerful enough to enforce our rights. Why? Because it was not the foundational law of the country. The Bill of Rights was not the supreme law of Canada. 
back then in 1960, the Constitution Act of Canada 1867 was the foundational law. And we saw in R versus Hines, it said that this constitutional law hinged public order and it demanded compliance and that we as individuals were expected to surrender our rights and freedoms our individual human rights and freedoms in order for the public good, public order. That was the operation of law that was transpiring. So again, just to walk you down through it. So prior to the Charter, we have the Bill of Rights. It's a statutory power. It's not foundational law. It's not the Constitution. It's not the Supreme Law of Canada, even though it expresses certain rights and freedoms. That's in 1960. The Constitution Act of Canada in 1960 was the supreme law of Canada, was the foundational law. And therefore, what it said overruled the statutory power. So the statutory power brought forth individual rights and freedoms for you and me, our human rights and freedoms, the right to life, liberty, security of the person, and the enjoyment of property. But yet the Constitution said, no, I'm sorry, you must surrender these rights. For the good of public order, we demand compliance. And we were stuck in this situation until 1982. In 1982, when they created the new Constitution Act and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, this got flipped upside down. Now, no longer, no longer was public order uh, uh, able to force us to comply. If your public order, your statutory powers, are trying to strip me of my fundamental rights and freedoms, my charter rights, my human rights and freedoms, common law, if we go back, remember, common law flowed into human rights, then it's of no force or effect against me. The Bill of Rights, statutory power, enactment created by Parliament, declares you have to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms. You have to respect common law rights. However, the Constitution Act of 1867, which is the ground law, the foundation law of the nation says public order above human rights and freedoms you are expected to comply now comes along the Constitution Act of 1982 we understand that this is the supreme law of Canada because it expresses the foundational law now of Canada because it is the Constitution and this says now that you must respect individual human rights and freedoms so it went from it went from being in a statutory power flowing into the foundational law of the country and that's where we get our power as individuals to enforce our fundamental rights and freedoms against the government because prior to this as i'm showing you here human rights and fundamental freedoms they were in a statutory power but the foundational law the constitution trumped them no nope, no nope, sorry you can complain you can try but you're expected to submit thus says the queen bow down hail hail mary to the to her majesty now comes Constitution of 1982, it says, wait, international law says that you guys have to include all of these rights here in the Bill of Rights, plus a lot more in your foundational law of the nation, and you're under obligation to respect these individual human rights and fundamental freedoms. So now if statutory power, statutory power tries to limit and abridge our fundamental rights and freedoms, we have the capacity to stand up and say, no, I'm sorry. Not anymore. Yes, before, you could force me under that constitution. I had a statutory power I could claim, I could call on, but it didn't help me. But now I have foundational law. Now I have the supreme law and the constitution. And says, you are under obligation to respect and ensure my individual rights and freedoms. You do what you want in public law. You do what you want in civil law. That's not my business. But if you try and override my natural state if you try and take away my fundamental rights and freedoms then you're breaching your own obligations and you're failing to respect and ensure what you promised within the charter of rights and freedoms if the legislator and we know they are if they are passing enactments and regulations that are stripping us of our fundamental rights and freedoms such as incorporating us into corporate bodies without our permission claiming the, that we are classes of beings known as officers to these corporations and then further claiming that we owe you obligations to the enactments and laws because now we are statutory creatures. This is an outright violation of our fundamental right and freedom under Article 7 of the Constitution Act of Canada. 
I have a human being and I am born free and I have the right and the capacity to remain free. You don't have the right to create a law out of the blue, or create a law out of existence and then say you have to submit to it because I declared so. The Constitution Act of 1982 is an expression of our human rights and freedoms. Some of the articles of law contained in this foundational document express natural law, common law, human rights, and fundamental freedoms. Court Judgment R v. Wagner, 2015 The Chief Justice goes on to note that these rules bind the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. The rules that he is talking about here are the foundational laws that state that Canada must respect and ensure our human rights, our fundamental freedoms as men and women. The debate is not so much about whether such norms exist, but what these norms are in relation to any given case where a litigant calls on such norms to his aid. Finally, at the developing fringes of the new natural law, which goes by the name of human rights. Thus, as important as these principles may be, and as essential as it may be in, that in difficult cases, the judge must stand against the winds and rains to uphold them. So we're seeing very clearly here that the new natural law goes by the name of human rights, human rights and fundamental freedoms. And it's imperative, and the judges and the courts are supposed to stand against the winds and the rains, stand against the statutory powers, and protect our fundamental rights and freedoms if we can prove to them that the statutory powers are limiting and abridging our human rights and freedoms. Now he goes on to state that those unwritten principles of our common law rights, of our human rights, that the minister at the beginning of the video said were grandfathered into Canadian law, the judge says tend to be largely replicated in the text of the Constitution, which Section 7 of the Canadian Charters of Rights and Freedoms, striking me as a prime example. Our written Constitution reflects many, many influences, including the drafter's awareness of natural law. The Constitution of 1982 brings forth the new natural law, as R. versus Wagner stated. And this new natural law is the expression of our human rights and fundamental freedoms. Now, judges are expected to uphold these rights. Wagner said you have to uphold them. You have to stand against the wind and the rains. You have to stand against the crown. You have to stand against the statutory power. If they're limiting and abridging charter rights of the individual, and the individual comes before you, it's your responsibility to uphold them. Now, these rights and these human rights and freedoms are now written into our Constitution. And since they're written to our Constitution, they became, they are the supreme law of the land, the foundational law. See, before they weren't written into the Constitution, they were in the Bill of Rights, statutory power, and what was that? That wasn't foundational law. But now, since 1982, human rights and fundamental freedoms are the supreme law, foundational law, and they must be respected. Whether by the executive powers, whether by the legislators, whether by the, the ones who make administrative judgments, or the judges themselves. The Constitution is an expression of international law. It includes the expression of our human rights and fundamental freedoms. In order to define our individual human rights and freedoms, we must look to international law to help define the right and the freedom. DeVito versus Canada, Supreme Court of Canada, 2013. Canada's international obligations and relevant principles of international law are also instructive in defining the right. So here we're seeing that the Supreme Court of Canada is saying when you're dealing with an individual right or freedom that they have to go into international law to see the content or the operative power of that right within international law and it's going to define it for Canada. What is the essence of that right? What is it supposed to be giving to that individual? The content of Canada's international human rights obligation is, in my view, an important indicia of the meaning of the full benefit of the Charter's protection. I believe that the Charter should generally be presumed to provide protection at least as great as that afforded by similar provisions in international human rights documents. It is clear that in order to define our individual human right and freedom, we must look to the obligations Canada is under 
and the principles of justice found in international law to help define the right. Association versus British Columbia. The Charter should be presumed to provide at least as great a level of protection as is found in the international human rights documents that Canada has ratified. The Charter has been brought forth into Canadian law as the foundational document concerning the laws that operate in Canada, as it pertains to human rights and freedoms. The Charter is to provide at least the same level of protection for our individual rights as we find expressed in the International Covenants. These rulings from these judges agree wholeheartedly with the operation of law found within the Covenant themselves. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 2.2 were not already provided for by existing legislative or other measures, each state party to the present covenant undertakes to take the necessary steps in accordance with its constitutional process and with the provisions of the present covenant to adopt such laws or other measures as may be necessary to give effect to the rights recognized in the present covenant. When we are looking to define our individual human rights and freedoms, we must look to international law to find the principle of justice that controls the right and freedom. Suresh versus Canada. The inquiry into the principles of fundamental justice is informed not only by Canadian experience and jurisprudence, but also by international law, including Jou which is common law. This takes into account Canada's international obligations and values as expressed in the various sources of international human rights law, declarations, and covenants. REBC Motor Vehicle Act Judgment The Principles of Fundamental Justice Given that, as the Attorney General for Ontario has acknowledged, when one reads the phrase Principles of Fundamental Justice, a single, incontrovertible meaning is not apparent. Its meaning must, in my view, be determined by reference to the interest which those words of the section are designed to protect. Then he goes on to say, Thus, Section 8 to 14 of the Constitution Act of 1982 provide an invaluable key to the meaning of the principles of fundamental justice. Many have developed over the time as presumptions of the common law. Others have found their expression in the International Covenant on Human Rights. Okay, stop. So the principles of fundamental justice have found their expression in the International Covenant on Human Rights. All he is saying here is that in order to define the right that is recognized for a man or a woman, that you need to look into the International Covenants, because within the International Covenants, you'll find the principles of fundamental justice concerning the right. It will describe the right for you in the Covenant. It will explain to you if... the if they are allowed to place a limitation upon that right or if they are not allowed to place a limitation on that right. All have been recognized as essential elements of a system for the administration of justice. As we can see, the principles of justice, the expression of our common law rights, have found their expression in the international covenants and subsequently have been transferred into the Constitution of 1982. RBC Motor Vehicle Act. The, the principles of fundamental justice are to be found in the basic tenets and principles not only of our judicial process, but also of the other components of our legal system. And what do you think he's talking about there? The principles are not limited to procedural guarantees, although many are of that nature. Whether any given principle may be said to be a principle of fundamental justice within the meaning of Section 7, must rest on an analysis of the nature, sources, rationale, and essential role of that principle within the judicial process and in our evolving legal system. The words, principle of fundamental justice, therefore, cannot be given any exhaustive content or simple enumerative definition, but will take on a concrete meaning as the courts address alleged violation of Section 7. In order to allege a violation of Section 7, writes, the individual must define what type of violation took place. And in order to determine the principle of justice as it pertains to the, that certain right, 
you must look into international law to define the right. The Constitution Act of 1982, it states that it guarantees the human rights and freedoms that are, that are found within it as a foundational document. Now, in order to define these rights that we're talking about, we must look to the international covenants. We have no choice, because within the international covenants, that's where we find the principles of justice. The principles of justice are not found just basically within the judiciary and within domestic law. As you saw in the video, the principles of justice are defined by international law. Now, for each right that is claimed, for each right that is claimed, there's a different principle of justice. For example, if you're talking about the right to vote as the citizen, okay, so we go into the International Covenant, it's in Article 25, ICCPR Article 25. It grants the citizen the right to vote. Now, during a time of emergency, war, natural disaster, um, military law, whatever it may be, this right to vote that the citizen has can be suspended. It can be limited and abridged. The covenant allows a limitation or abridgment to be placed directly on that right. So that would be the principle of fundamental justice concerning voting. So if we were going to look and say, what's the principle of fundamental justice? We look into Article 25. It says every citizen has a right to vote. But that right to vote can be limited or abridged in a time of emergency, war, whatever it may be. So that's the principle of fundamental justice concerning the right to vote. Now, if you want to look at the principle of fundamental justice concerning your right to enter into recognition as a person before the law, Article 16. Well, we go there and we see that everyone, the human being, has the right, not the obligation, to enter into recognition as a person before the law. So we have this right. Now, when we further look into it, does the covenant allow for a limitation to be placed against this right? No, it doesn't. Because when we look into the covenant itself in Article 4, it specifically states that this right here, Article 16, the state party, our countries, can never place a limitation or abridgment upon that right. So we have the right to enter into recognition as a person before the law, if we so choose, and that's the principle of justice. It's our choice, and that choice can never be limited or abridged, even in a time of national emergency. So which each and every right that we have, human rights and fundamental freedoms, or even if you're looking for statutory rights, as a statutory creature, as a citizen, as a person, you have to go into the covenant, find the right, the expression of the right, find if a limitation can be placed upon it, and then find what obligation your state party had to transfer it over into domestic law. The expression of our human rights and fundamental freedoms, our common law rights, as they used to be called, had to find their output or outsource, had to be located within the Constitution Act of Canada of 1982, and not within statutory powers. Because these are human rights and fundamental freedoms, and they have to be contained within the foundational law of the country, within the foundational law of a nation. That's why they're placed in the Constitution Act of Canada. That's why we find them in Article 7 of, uh, of the Constitution Act and Article 26. So they left it open. They said that the, the rights and freedoms that we listed here presently in the Constitution Act is not going to be taken to mean that Canada doesn't recognize that there are other rights and freedoms that exist within Canada, but they're not, li they're not listed in the Constitution Act. Because they had to leave it open and they had to make sure that all of our human rights and freedoms are contained in the foundational law. Now, Statutory creatures, statutory powers, no, that has to be done through enactments and regulations. So all the rights that we see that pertain to, for example, the statutory creature, those are enforced through enactments and regulations as you're exercising civil rights. Hunter versus Southam Charter Interpretation A constitution is drafted with an eye to the future. Its function is to provide a continuing framework for the legislative exercise of governmental power and, when joined by a bill or a charter of rights, for the unremitting protection of individual rights and liberties. So a constitution is what? What's it there for? An unremitting protection of individual rights and liberties. Once enacted, its provisions cannot easily be repealed or amended. It must therefore be capable of growth and development over time to meet new social, political, and historical realities, often unimagined by its framers. The judiciary is the guardian of the Constitution, 
and must, in implementing its provision, bear these considerations in mind. Therefore, it is necessary to assess the importance of a right or freedom in context along with its purpose. The right or freedom must then, in accordance with the dictates of this court, be given a generous interpretation aimed at fulfilling that purpose and securing for the individual the full benefit of this guarantee. So the court's obligation is to look at the right and to see the right and the freedom and to see how it operates for the full benefit of the individual and to find the operation or the principal function of the right you have to look into the international covenant to see what the covenant says about the right how it's defined the court must interpret these rights with the purpose of securing and ensuring the right and freedom for the individual the court is under obligation according to the rule of law to stand against the executive powers and legislative powers in order to uphold our individual human rights and fundamental freedoms. R versus Wagner, the Chief Justice goes on to note that these rules bind the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. The debate is not so much about whether such norms exist, but what those norms are in relation to any given case where a litigant calls on such norms to his aid. Thus, as important as these principles may be, and as essential as it may be in difficult cases, the judge must stand against the winds and rains to uphold them. Manitoba Language Rights The legislative bodies in Canada must conform to the structural imperatives of the Canadian Constitution, and they may not override them. Kingsway also submitted that this court should not interpret Canadian statute affecting rights in isolation, but should consider the values and principles contained in international law, applicable international conventions to which Canada is a party, and interpretations of those values and principles by international human rights tribunals. So again, we're seeing that the courts are declaring, when it comes to talking about the rights of an individual, our fund especially our fundamental human rights and freedoms, that the principles of justice are going to be contained within international law. And those principles of justice should have found their expression within the foundational document within the Constitution Act of 1982. So in order to find out the principles of justice as it pertains to our human rights and freedoms, the court is under the obligation to use the international covenants to help define the scope of the right. The court is to evaluate the statutory power against the rights expressed in the covenants and the rights enumerated within the Constitution Act of 1982. Again, the veto versus Canada. Canada's international obligations and relevant principles of international law are also instructive in defining the right. The courts are to interpret the right that you're claiming is being limited and abridged to give the individual, to give you the full benefit of the protection of this right. And remember, the principle of justice concerning that right flows from the international covenant into the charter. Now, the court is to stand against the statutory powers, to stand against the rains and the winds of these statutory powers to protect the individual rights and freedoms when you're there. Now remember, Kingsway also said this, that Canadian statutes affecting rights are not in isolation. So these statutes that are being examined, that we are claiming are breaching our fundamental rights and freedoms, you don't, they shouldn't be just examining them in isolation and saying, well, what's wrong with them? I don't see anything wrong with them. They have to be held up to the light of the international covenants. They have to be held up to the light of the charter. And then we have to look and see, okay, is there an abridgment or a limitation of the fundamental right and freedom? That's why the court was very clear about that. When individuals come before them, they're not supposed to look at the statute and in isolation and say, well, you know, well, what's going on here? No, 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 no. There's a, set, there's a rule of law that's to be followed. And that rule of law says this. Human rights and fundamental freedoms are now primary before public law. And if a statutory power is removing, limiting, or abridging our fundamental human rights and freedoms, then... As Section 52 of the Constitution Act of Canada declares, it's of no force or effect against us.
and the courts have already declared, and I'm not including this in this in this video, but the courts have already declared, you can check my other videos, that a judicial declaration, a court judgment, is but by one means to enforce your fundamental rights and freedoms against these statutory creatures that are trying to claim that you owe them statutory obligations. An evil little trick. When we believe that our fundamental human rights and freedoms have been limited and abridged by a statutory power, we can seek a remedy, and this remedy, upholding our charter rights, is designated the administration of justice. Supreme Court of Canada, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Honorable Gerald Mitchell, January 2014, the administration of justice. According to Grant, the term administration of justice in section 24 concerns maintaining the rule of law and its processes and includes upholding charter rights in the justice system as a whole. An individual that has been denied or infringed upon their fundamental rights and freedoms is seeking the administration of justice, is seeking to have his or her rights and freedoms respected. In the statutory power designated the Department of Justice enactment, the Attorney General is charged with the administration of justice. This office has the responsibility to uphold charter rights and freedoms, all the more so when it pertains to fundamental human rights and freedoms. Department of Justice, Canada, Article 4. The Minister is the official legal advisor of the Governor General and the legal member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, and shall have the superintendence of all matters connected with the administration of justice in Canada. When a statutory power, an enactment, is created, this office of the Attorney General is under obligation to examine the new laws and make a legal declaration that this statutory power, this enactment, is not inconsistent, does not limit or abridge our fundamental human rights and freedoms. The office, or the one representing the office at the time, signs off on the new law, declaring that according to them, these laws do not limit and abridge our fundamental human rights and freedoms. Department of Justice Act, Statutory Power, Examination of Bills and Regulations, Article 4.1. Subject to subsection 2, the minister shall, in accordance with such regulations as may be prescribed by the Governor General and Council, examine every regulation, every statutory power, transmitted to the Clerk of the Privy Council for registration pursuant to the Statutory Instrument Act, and every bill, enactment, regulation, introduced in or presented to the House of Commons by a Minister of the Crown. Now, what does he have to do? In order to ascertain, to verify, whether any of the provisions thereof are inconsistent with the purposes and provisions of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the Minister shall report any such inconsistencies to the House of Commons at the first convenient opportunity. So after the Office of the Attorney General signs off on these statutory powers, this office then automatically places the judges of the justice system under the impression that all statutory powers respect the rule of law, respect the fundamental rights and freedoms enumerated in the Constitution Act of 1982. The judges now presume that all of these statutory laws respect our fundamental rights and freedoms, even though they do not. So because the Attorney General, who is in charge of the administration of justice and is supposed to know and understand about fundamental rights and freedoms, about human rights and freedoms, about the ones that are never to be limited or abridged, he reads these statutory powers and then he makes a report and says, well, okay, we believe that they don't limit and abridge fundamental rights and freedoms. And he signs off on them and they're given force of law. Now the judges presume because it already went through a verification, it already went through a check with the Attorney General's office, the judges are under the presumption that all these statutory powers are not limiting and abridging our fundamental rights and freedoms. And we find it in R versus Hape. Since it is a well-established principle of statutory interpretation, that legislation will be presumed. You see that? It doesn't say that it does conform to international law. It doesn't say that it's respecting our fundamental rights and freedoms. It says that legislation will be presumed to conform to international law. And it's only presumed to conform to international law 
because the Office of the Attorney General signed off on the statutory power and said it conforms. In interpreting the scope of the application of a charter, a court should seek to ensure compliance with Canada's binding obligations under international law where the express words are capable of supporting such a construction. One, final general principle bears on the resolution of the legal issue in this appeal. It is a well-established principle of statutory interpretation that legislation will be presumed to conform to international law. And there it is again. The judges, they presume that all statutory powers, all enactments and regulations conform to international law. That there's been no limitation or abridgment placed upon you by these statutory powers. So, for example, if you use the Municipal Act and you say, well, I'm being incorporated into my local municipality, into a company, and they're forcing me to play the role of a class of being as an officer, well, the judge, he believes that the legislation, that the statutory power conforms to international law. And not only do you got to show him that this is what the statutory power is doing to you, it's limiting and abridging you by forcing you to play the class of person and forcing you to be part of a corporate body, you got to go into the international law and show your right and show the operation of law of your right and the principle of justice attached to your right and show the judge that this law here, this statutory power, is denying and limiting and abridging my fundamental human right and freedom. The courts and the judges who rule in the courts are under the presumption that all domestic law respects our human rights and fundamental freedoms. If we can show that in fact our rights have been limited and abridged, then the court must stand against the executive powers and protect our rights and freedoms. Again, R versus Wagner. Thus, as important as these principles, fundamental rights and freedoms, may be, and as essential as it may be that in difficult cases, the judge must stand against the winds and the rains to uphold them. When you're claiming that there's been a violation, a limitation, an abridgment against your fundamental rights and, and freedoms, this is called the, you're seeking the administration of justice. You're seeking to uphold your charter rights, your human rights and freedoms. Now, the Office of the Attorney General is the office that has been charged with the administration of justice. That office and the person who runs that office, when they're appointed as the minister, they are in charge of the administration of justice. And part of their duties and part of their responsibilities that they have been charged with is that they must examine enactments, regulations, statutory powers that are being passed, new laws that are being created, to see if they limit or abridge human rights and fundamental freedoms. And if they, if they believe that they don't limit fundamental rights and freedoms, then they sign off on these bills. And they declare, no, this law is valid, that law is valid, according to us, it doesn't limit fundamental rights and freedoms, it respects charter rights. Now, because they do that, the judges by default, as we see in R versus Hate, they presume, they presume, they believe, that the enactment, the statutory power that we're complaining about, respects human rights and fundamental freedoms. And why? Because of the evil trick that was played. This guy up here makes a declaration, then he puts the judges under presumption that these statutory powers are respecting our human rights and freedoms. So then it's up to us to show them that they're not. So what do we have to do? We have to take the right, the human right and freedom that's being infringed upon, show them how the statutory power is limiting and abridging our fundamental right and freedom. We have to go into the international covenants, bring up the principle of justice that governs that specific right, and find out if they're allowed to put a limitation or abridgment on it. If not, then we go and we say, I have this fundamental human right and freedom, it's listed in the International Covenants. It's been placed in our foundational law, in the Constitution Act of Canada. And now the legislator, the government, has created a statutory power and they're trying to limit and abridge my right, my freedom. They're saying I have to give up my right and freedom in order to submit to this power, which I don't have to do anymore. 
prior to the Constitution of 1982, yeah, the operation of law said, your rights are just a statutory power, not foundational law. Now, since the advent of the Charter, our human rights and freedoms are foundational law. This statutory power has no force or effect against me. It's limiting and abridging my human right and fundamental freedom. The local municipalities where we live, which are using statutory powers to limit and abridge our fundamental rights and freedoms, are accountable to the Charter, and the actions they are taking against us are subject to the Charter, and by default subject to our fundamental human rights and freedoms. Gobert v. Longay Since municipalities cannot but be described as governmental entities, they are subject to the Canadian Charter. First, Municipal councils are democratically elected by members of the general public and are accountable to their constituents, in a manner to that in which Parliament and the provincial legislators are accountable to the electorates they represent. Second, municipalities possess a general taxing power that, for the purposes of determining whether they can rightfully be described as government, is indistinguishable from the taxing powers of the Parliament or the provinces. Third, and importantly, municipalities are empowered to make laws, to administer them, and to enforce them within the defined territorial jurisdiction. Finally, and most significantly, municipalities derive their existence and law-making authority from the provinces. As the Canadian Charter clearly applies to the provincial legislators and governments, it also must apply to the entities upon which they confer governmental powers within their authority. Otherwise, provinces could simply avoid the application of the Charter by devolving powers on municipal bodies. Further, since a municipality is governmental in nature, all its activities are subject to Charter review. The municipalities are using a statutory power to incorporate us as an officer, as a class of being, into the body corporate. This action is a complete violation of our fundamental rights and freedoms. Forcing me to be part of a corporate body and to obey the rules and regulations of this corporate body is violating my freedom. These actions of our local municipalities are subject to the Charter and must, must be challenged for the greater good of all men and women. Gosselin versus Quebec It is clear that Section 7 surely protects the right not to be deprived of one's life, liberty, and security of the person when that is done in breach of the principles of fundamental justice. The question now becomes, do you believe that being incorporated into their body corporate, being designated a statutory creature, exercising civil rights given to you by a statutory power without your consent, is this a violation of the principles of justice found within the International Covenants and within the Constitution Act of 1982. You can watch my video, Law Comes in the Great Delusion, to get the answer to that question and more. Do you believe that being incorporated into the corporate body designated Canada, being forced to play the designation of an officer of Canada, operating an office of Canada for the purpose of income tax collection, is a violation of the principles of justice as found in the Covenants and the Constitution Act of 1982. You can watch my videos located in YouTube concerning this and see if the executive powers have violated the principles of justice. The videos are titled Canada the Corporation and You're Their Officer and also Taxation, Are You Part of Canada? A thought as I share the end of this video. Remember, Municipalities, their actions, their deeds, are subject to the Charter, even though they are corporate bodies. These corporate bodies, these municipalities, they are statutory creatures created by law and given rights through enactments and regulations, through statutory law, enactments and bylaws. Through these statutory laws, enactments and bylaws, they incorporate you, make you a class of being a statutory creature controlled by these enactments and bylaws and statutory powers.
Now, if they incorporate you, make you a class of being, take you out of your full legal capacity into a statutory creature, exercising civil rights, controlled and governed by their powers, by their laws, don't you think you have something to say to bring this all subjected to the Charter and say what's going on here? I'm a man, I'm a woman, in my full legal capacity, and along comes a statutory power claiming that I have to give up, give up my rights and freedoms and submit to being or playing the role of a statutory creature in this specific case called the officer of your corporation and submit to the executive powers and have you rule over me with statutory law enactments and bylaws. It's a breach of our fundamental rights and freedoms. And these municipalities, guess what? Again, they're subject to the charter. Their actions, their deeds, their laws are subject to the charter. But what did Canada do? Well, won't teach you your human rights and fundamental freedoms. Won't teach you the operations of law to enforce your fundamental rights and freedoms. So then, when they come around, and other statutory creatures come around, making demands upon you, and claiming that you owe obligations to the enactments, to the bylaws, that you have to exercise civil rights, you'll say, yes, yes, yes. A thought I share as I end this video. Remember that all statutory creatures who operate on behalf of Canada are exercising statutory powers. And these powers, along with the obligations they claim you have to them, are all subject to the Constitution of 1982, are all subject to your fundamental human rights and freedoms. Slate Communications Incorporated versus Davidson, Supreme Court of Canada. The reference in Section 32 to the Parliament and a legislator make clear that the Charter operates as a limitation on the powers of those legislative bodies. Any statute enacted by either Parliament or legislator, which is inconsistent with the Charter, will be outside the power of the enacting body and will be invalid. Now notice that. How would that be possible? How can the judge make such a declaration if any statute enacted? Well, prior to it ever being enacted, the Attorney General has to read through it and sign off on it and declare that his office believes that there's been no limitation or abridgment of our human rights and freedoms through this statute. So now, but now here the judge is saying any statute that is enacted by parliament or legislator that is inconsistent with the charter, it will be invalid. So who is it up to? Who has to prove that the statute is invalid? The attorney general, the judge, or you? It follows that anybody exercising statutory authority, for example, the governor and council, or lieutenant governor and council, ministers, officials, municipalities, school boards, universities, administrative tribunals, and police officers are also bound by the Charter. Action taken under statutory authority is valid only if it's in with, within the scope of that authority. Since neither Parliament nor legislator can itself pass a law in breach of the Charter, well then you should be telling the Attorney General, because he's signing off on all these bills, neither body can authorize action which would be in breach of the Charter. Thus, the limitations on statutory authority which are imposed by the Charter will flow down the chain of statutory authority and apply to regulations, bylaws, orders, decisions, and all other action, whether legislative, administrative, or judicial, which depends for its validity on statutory authority.